Hello all and welcome to today's interview. My name is Emily and in this series we sit down with pastors from Rock Harbor Church to discuss highly debated Christian topics and Bible passages that may be difficult to understand. With me today I have Pastor Michael Collins. Pastor Michael, how are you? I'm well, Emily. Awesome. Thank you. If you could start us off by briefly introducing yourself, tell us a little bit about your background and maybe some of your roles and responsibilities here at Rock Harbor. Okay, I'm Michael Collins. I am one of the pastors, at, uh, associate pastors at Rock Harbor. And my background, I've been with Rock Harbor for about 12 years. We did move to Fresno for a short time for an evangelistic um, situation. And uh, after five years of being gone, we came back. We uh, are here now back at the church. And I've been in the pastor role for uh, probably a couple of years. I started attending the pastor's meeting um, and then became recently um, licensed as a pastor. So my, my role here is uh, support the other pastors. Uh, I do a lot of hospital visits. That's kind of my niche is hospital visits. And I'm gonna be starting our, my first official Bible study with Rock Harbor starting next month. And then perhaps I will speak to the congregation in the near future. So That's awesome. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about your Bible study as it develops. And uh, I know I can speak personally that we are just happy that you moved back from Fresno to come here and, and stay with Rock Harbor. And we're happy to have you on board. Uh, today's topic, we're going to discuss Satan, his origin, and some of his tactics. I know that's a very big topic and we can go so many directions with it. But we're just going to kind of do a brief overview and I wanted to start, a, start us off really quickly with a lot of culture today, not necessarily the church, but a lot of culture kind of pictures Satan as this little red guy with um, a pointy tail and some thorns and a pitchfork. And he gives you this moral dilemma between whether you choose the naughty cookies instead of a salad. And it's very uh, watered down and none of that really is rooted in scripture. And so we want to get a good scriptural foundation of who Satan is, where he came from, and why that even matters to study as a Christian. We tend to focus on Jesus, which yes, obviously he's our Lord and Savior, but it's good to know when we're in warfare, we need to know our enemy too. And so that's really our point today is to get a good foundation with that. So my first question for you is just his origins. What does the Bible say about who Satan is and where he came from? Okay, well, Satan, the Bible has a, quite a bit to say about Satan, but Satan um, is actually the, his title. It's basically what he does. It's more of his function, and he's an accuser of the brethren. Mm. His, his Hebrew name is Helel ben Shakar, but we call him Satan. It's translated into English as Lucifer. Um, so, that's basically what he is, is he, he's an accuser. And, and there's scripture to support it. Job and Zechariah and Revelation talk about him being a, an accuser of the brethren. Okay. So very similar to how God has many different names as <clears throat> wonderful counselor, mighty father, or we call Jesus the Prince of Peace or Emmanuel. Satan is just one of the descriptions of who his real name, Halel ben Shakar, is. Okay, well, that's definitely, that clears up a lot of information. Um, when we read the creation account, obviously God created this perfect Garden of Eden for Adam and Eve. And all of a sudden, there's this fallen creature, which is Satan, who is in the serpent. And I don't want to take too much away from you on, on wording, but where... Where did Satan come from if it, he just kind of seems like he comes out of the creation account out of nowhere? If God created this perfect world, how is this fallen creature in a perfect world? Sure. And, and Ezekiel talks about a description of who he was. He was an ark cherub, and, so, and he was a covering angel. Well, he was really more, um, there's three classes of what we call angels. Um, there's the cherub and the seraph and the, and the messenger angels. Okay. So Michael, the archangel, he's the, the highest ranking angel, messenger angel. But Hello Ben Shakar was a covering angel. He, he was in, originally created in the throne of God, and he covered over the, um, the throne. And then he was assigned 
to the earth um, in the gem garden. It was okay. different than the Garden of Eden, it w which was a vegetable garden. He was o over the gem garden on earth. And then he um, lifted up his heart against the Lord. You know, the, f the, f the five I wills in Isaiah. He started as, wow, I kind of like, I'd kind of like to be like God. Mm -hmm. Now he thought those, thought those things in his heart. And, and, and eventually, you know, because of that, he, he um, went and started what, what the Bible calls trading, where he started to uh, seek out uh, other angels that would f basically rebel with him against God. And so because of that, he was judged. Mm. And he was, he was kicked out of the garden. And then he, then he was... Um, um, Basically, uh, um, in space, you know, on the on the Earth from a space standpoint. Okay, so Satan was created with perfection, but he chose in his heart to rebel against God, and that is what that's how we know him today. Yeah, the, Bi the Bible describes him as as, as beautiful, and he was um, talks about um, music. He was like the the, the lead worshipper in mm. heaven, and um, he was maxed out in his capacity. So he's basically, as, as Ezekiel said, that he, he was perfect okay. in, in, in his ways. And, and we can always read that particular passage if we, if we have time. Okay. I maybe yeah, if you want to go ahead and, and maybe just hit on where in the Bible it is. It's up to you how much yeah. you want to read. Yeah, Ezekiel 28, 11 through 19, that describes... Um, uh, Hell Hill Ben Shakar. Okay. Very cool. So the Bible says that demons and fallen angels exist and they're under the authority of Satan. And you hit on that when Satan went and to other angels and then created this dissension before mankind was created. Are demons and fallen angels the same thing? I know you kind of hit on the different classifications of cherubim, seraphs, and then messenger angels. But that's we hit on that touch with maybe those who are, for better words, on God's side. Now let's go to Satan's side. We hear demons and fallen angels thrown around. Are they the same or are they different? Yeah, they are different. And what it is that the demons are the are the spirits of the Nephilim. Okay. In Genesis six, it talks about the sons of God went into the daughters of men, and what that's saying, the sons of God is. Basically, the, the the Elohim, the 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 fallen angels, mm -hmm. having marriage relationships and reproducing with human women. Okay. And so, when the flood happened, and those Nephilim died, those spirits left the body, and they were in the form of demons. Mm. And and one of the characteristics, there is a difference between their characteristics. For example, demons don't like water. We see that in the story of when Jesus casting out demons um, and then they went into the swine mm -hmm. and then the swine went off. They, they, they don't like water. Whereas, whereas fallen angels, it doesn't matter. Another characteristic is that fallen angels can physically manifest. Mm. Whereas demons uh, don't manifest, they, they possess. They, they okay. like to be possessed. They can possess people if the people give permission or they can possess animals like in the case of the swine. Okay. Very cool. Okay, so you kind of hit on where they came from. I'm going to briefly pivot to a different topic within this this overarching category. So why Satan seems to, whatever humans have, just attack after it. Obviously, Adam and Eve had authority over the earth, and Satan came in and uh, stole or usurped that authority from mankind. And right now we call him the God of this world. He still has that. And we know based off of prophecy that Jesus is going to come back and rightfully take that authority back again. But he has this seeming perpetual hatred for people. And I understand why he's rebelled against God. He's made that point clear in scripture, but why this hatred for humans? Because he can't do anything to God. Mm. He can't affect God. So what he does is he goes after humans. And, and the evidence of that is, is the immorality, 
homosexuality, um, abortion, things like that. I mean, you can see his hatred for humans, and mm. humans can reproduce and things. And so that's how he gets back, basically gets back at God. Okay. And to get more specific, obviously for Christians, he's going to have extra warfare added on top of that because people are trying to follow the Lord. So I understand that there's warfare with that, but we can even see today in the news in 2024, we're in the middle of watching a war between Israel and many Arab nations. Um, And we've kind of narrowed down that a lot of that is not just physical, it's spiritual. And so Satan is behind that. But why does Satan have such a hatred for Israel, whether they're saved or not saved? Yeah, it's very similar to why he goes after Christians. I mean, um, Israel is God's chosen people. And ever since he's made the promise to Abraham in, in, in Genesis 12, he's been trying to attack that. And we can see the evidence of that, for example, with Pharaoh, um, you know, seeking to kill the babies mm-hmm. and... And then you even see it later with Jesus. You know, he's trying to, he's trying to do whatever he can to kill off the Jews so that it leaves God in a situ- leaves God in a legal situation where you can't keep basically say, Satan saying to God, you can't keep your promises. Therefore, mm-hmm. you're not qualified in a way to be God. Okay. From a legal standpoint. So. Okay. Many churches today leave hell and Satan out of their sermons. That's not really the f- most fun topic on Sunday. Uh, which I get, you want to come to church, you want to be refreshed, you want to be encouraged going out into the week, and hell and Satan don't really encourage. It's still necessary, though. Um, A lot of churches claim that preaching on Satan and hell is too negative of a message, and their aim is to encourage, give good news, or really only focus on the gospel. They just kind of only sit in the gospel and we don't want to touch Satan in any scriptures with that. What is your take on this personally and as a pastor and maybe just kind of touch up on the consequences of avoiding this topic? Well, truth without love or love without truth isn't love. And you ba- basically they're depriving their congregations of understanding the enemy in order to use, this is a spiritual warfare and yes it is God's battle but we need to understand our enemy and if we don't we can get ourselves in a lot of trouble mm. so for example the spiritual realm is a very um, or, or authority oriented you know if you if you're coming in and if you're coming in and you're you're doing spiritual warfare but you get out of authority which is in our case the authority in Christ we're going to foul things and we're going to make things dangerous for ourselves they're, they're going to torment us. They're going to oppress us as believers. Mm-hmm. So it's important to stay in the proper authority. So these, these pastors are really doing their congregation a disservice by not teaching the whole counsel of God. Mm. I remember hearing uh, in studying various scriptures about one of the, you know, the official title of a pastor is a shepherd of the church and going back to David in the Psalms saying, your rod and your staff comfort me. And how the staff is meant to keep the sheep together, but the rod is meant to drive away the enemies. And I know you you probably see more than I do as a pastor, but we look at various churches and even other religions that I, I know that they aren't rooted in truth, but many religions don't drive the enemy away. Many churches don't drive the enemy away. They only just try to keep the flock together. And that's how... Satan gets in the church. Right. Well, I mean, I mean that's, um, you know, it's a house divided against itself, you know, is going to fall. Mm. So it's divided against itself. So Satan's not going to be divided against Satan. So anything outside of Christ is satanic. So, of course, they're not going to uh, talk about the enemy. Mm-hmm. But even, even the pastors that don't talk about it, they're, they're um, you know, it could be that they're just trying to tickle the ears of the people. Mm. And it could come down to just growing people in quantity rather than quality of of discipleship. Mm. On that point, do you think that Satan leaves churches alone that aren't really, and I I know this sounds rhetorical, but does Satan leave churches alone that aren't really making a big impact for the kingdom of God? Do you think he just kind of lets them do their own thing and be complacent? Yes, and I've seen it. Mm. I've seen it where, 
There might be a church that's theologically sound, but they're in their comfort zone, so they don't go outside it. We're not going to talk about topics that are going to um, cause controversy or stretch people. We mm. want to keep it safe, so we're just going to talk about safe little, you know, Jesus loves you, and he walked on water, and, and you can be like Jesus. Mm. Why would God create Satan in the first place if he knew he would end up being what he is today? I know it's kind of a loaded question, sure. but I think that has a lot of implications on God's character. If you know, A lot of people say, like, why would God let this happen if he allows evil? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, he knew that it was going to happen, but it doesn't mean that he controlled that because he does give free will. Even to, the, to Hela Ben Shakar, he gave free will. And he gives humans free will. And he knows what we're going to do. But he doesn't control it. I mean, the greatest, one of the greatest attributes of him being that he's loving is he's given us free will. And so we're not robots and, and things. So, so um, yeah, he, he, he gave free will. So he knew it was going to happen. Why did he still create him? Because he still has a plan. He can still work mm-hmm. things out. I mean... Yes, Satan can't repent. He's already under judgment because of his position. Mm. When he was the 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 ark, or when he was an ark cherub, and he was over the throne, he was so close to God that he doesn't have the opportunity to repent. However, humans do, and God he causes all things to work together for humans that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So He still uses this in His grand scheme of, mm. or His grand plan. I think, too, just to kind of comment after that, it's hard to remember as humans, we're so time-bound that we forget that God's outside of time. And to to us, you know, we're in the middle of this war happening, but to God, the war's already, already won. The prophecy that we study in the future of, you know, God having the final word and what Satan's future is, you know, it, this is, God is outside of all of this. And so there's no, you know, we don't worship a God of defeat. He's always a God of victory. And I know for me, that gives me personal encouragement when dealing with the topic of Satan and warfare and, and his tactics, for sure. Yeah, he's, he's not bound by time. He created time. He's not bound by his creation at all. So he sees it all at one time. That's why a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. Mm-hmm. Because it doesn't mean anything to him. We worship a big God, don't we? Yes. <laughs> what is, going into Satan's, I guess, God's plan and the future, what is the purpose of, uh, there's different words, but people say hell or Hades or um, the lake of fire. Who was hell created for originally and maybe kind of go into God's future plans with that. Yeah, hell, hell. I mean, if you're talking about the lake of fire, then it was created for Satan and, and the demons. And it wasn't created for humans originally, but, but the non-believers at the white throne judgment will be cast into the lake of fire. Okay. Now, pivoting to, for Christians, we read in Ephesians 6 about the armor of God and... I feel like that's a completely separate episode just to discuss the armor of God, but to touch on it, who is the armor of God for? What is the purpose of it? And when we think of armor, we're obviously thinking of war. And so in that context, what is that for, for people? Yeah, it's a, it's metaphoric, of course, um, but it, it's for, it's for believers. And basically if you're doing what you're supposed to do, the, the basic practices of being a believer in Christ, you have the helmet of salvation, you have the sword of the spirit, you have the belt of truth, the, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, peace, which is the gospel, you're at peace with God. And if you, if you have those things, then that's your warfare. Um, that's basically how you war in the spirit. And it boils down to you're saved and you're obedient. Mm. You're obedient to the Lord. Stay submitted to the Lord, and basically you'll have the full arm, armor of God. If you get outside of that, then you don't have, like you're not in the Word of God. You don't know the Word of God. You don't know how to, um, uh, you know, fight that battle with truth, or you're not living righteously. Then you become um, vulnerable to the 
wiles of the enemy, mm. Satan. It, it goes to show the importance of fellowship with God that Satan is clearly far greater than we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that people forget that it's not our own defense that we're putting up. It's God's defense. And you can't use the armor and apply that and apply the truth if you're not in the word and knowing what the truth is. So what are some real world consequences of the church not teaching a proper view of Satan and hell? And I know that we talked about the consequences in the church, but what are the cultural consequences of the church not speaking on this? Mm -hmm. then, then the people the people in the congregations don't know how to fight the battle outside. They only know what's inside, but when they're faced with it like in the world, then they don't know how to battle it. They mm -hmm. don't know the truth. And, and that's what I was saying about some of the churches that are giving a comfortable little message on Sunday and then they go into the world they say okay we're not going to talk about this we're only going to talk about the good things but then when they go in the world that's where the real battle is they're not a properly equipped to fight those battles yeah so then they lose the culture war they quiet they don't know enough so they and I know from personal experience not knowing enough about a topic being in the world and just keeping my mouth shut you know in the past you know um, just just not knowing how to fight the battle yeah, I can I can speak as uh, a millennial and also someone who is involved with uh, helping a lot of youth try to focus on the Lord. It, when the church doesn't speak on something, like you said, it you're not equipped. And then sometimes people grow up, they leave the home or they go to college. And especially in college, they're just swallowed up alive with lies. And I know that I can at least speak for myself and my own testimony. The only way to combat those lies is turning back to the truth and knowing it, because if you don't, it's easy to just roll over and let the culture win whatever the topic or whatever the discussion or debate is for yeah, sure. Be, be as wise as what wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. Mm. I mean, when we go out in the world, we need to be, we need to understand the enemy and we shouldn't be in a bubble just because we're Christian, especially, you know, dealing with youth and children, we shouldn't keep, as, you know, as parents and things, we shouldn't keep them, in, and pastors, we shouldn't keep people in a bubble. Mm. Need to, they don't have to participate with the evil, but they need to understand the enemy. Mm. I think part of what Satan has done so successfully is to diminish his own character, to not be such a big enemy, but also to diminish the importance of the role of a Christian. I, I see a lot of people... Um, they want to be just kind of passive Christians and they think that if I'm not nice, then I'm doing something wrong. Right. When, when we see evil happening, the Lord is very clear about you speak against that. And I, I know you read in the gospels, Jesus was pretty offensive to a lot of the people do, committing evil. Um, that's pretty counterintuitive to what a lot of the cultural Christianity mm -hmm. purports today. Yeah. That's one of his tactics is, Christians were not called to be nice people. I mean, we're kind and loving, but we weren't just called to be nice people. Mm. Just be nice. Yeah. It's another lie that he, That's another lie. That yeah. he gives. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I have one last question for you. Real briefly, could you walk us through a couple examples of Satan's tactics? I know that you mentioned um, culturally how he shows homosexuality and abortion and really pushes all of that onto the culture. But um, however many examples you want to give of some of Satan's tactics. Well, I think the one that comes to mind right away is if he can get us comfortable, you get us distracted and not, not necessarily get involved in something that's bad or out and out sin, but just get us comfortable with things that aren't necessarily bad, but they're a distraction from from basically the the practices that w w we talked about with the armor of God. Yeah. Okay. Not studying our word. If we uh, watch a, uh, a movie, not that movies, watching movies are bad, but I'm saying that if we're over the top on doing things when we could be doing from a discipleship standpoint, things that God, that would further us, m mature us in Christ, okay. then he's got us, that's the beginning of the trap. And then we become comfortable. Yeah. He likes to flip priorities. He likes to flip priorities. Okay. 
Yeah, I, th I think that really understanding our enemy. I mean, yes, we, we submit to God and under that authority, we still need to understand the enemy of our warfare mm. and not go outside. You know, there's a uh, passage in Acts where there was the seven sons of Sceva and they were casting out demons by the, the, by the Jesus that Paul preached. And it was because they didn't have a relationship with Christ. Mm. And because they didn't have a relationship with Christ, they weren't in fellowship with Christ. And they were casting out demons in the wrong authority. And those demons came out, or the men actually that were demon-possessed, attacked the men. Mm. And that's because they weren't in the proper authority. But we're in a proper authority. We still need to understand the tactics of our enemy from a biblical perspective. Mm. It goes to show the importance of being rooted in Scripture, having a good church that teaches the truth, and being with the body of Christ. Absolutely. I heard this quote a couple days ago where God. it was said that God didn't create the body of Christ for you to live outside of the body. And... It, none of us can do it on our own. It, it's Absolutely. it's all the Lord and, and His power, which is far greater than any enemy that we have. Yeah, the last thing we want to do is get isolated mm -hmm. and be on our own because we can't stand without our, our, our spiritual family. Amen. Pastor Michael, did you want to close us out in prayer briefly and just kind of finish this interview out? Sure. Absolutely. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and and talk about this topic that is very scriptural. We're doing it from the authority that's in you, God. We're doing it from a theological standpoint. And we just pray that people that are listening to this that may not have an understanding of spiritual warfare or the enemy, that they would use it that in this time and from listening to this interview that they would better understand and really dig into the Word of God and, and continue to put on the armor of God and obey God and submit themselves to God so that they can protect themselves from our enemy. We, we thank you for all this and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.